Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Um, I've got a keyboard that came in today um, and uh, I kind of wanted to make a video about fixing a keyboard. Um, so this keyboard is a Logitech K800 and this is a wireless backlit keyboard um, and the USB port on it for charging it is busted. So we're gonna, we're gonna replace the USB port. Um, and uh, this starts an interesting conversation that I've had on uh, the podcast a couple of times where I l really like fixing peripherals because a lot of people have a, an old keyboard or an old gaming mouse that they really like, but it's just like the buttons on it are worn out or a port has broken or a cable is broken or something like that, and no one fixes them. Um, and part of the reason for that is just because a lot of the time it's not economical to fix, um, but sometimes it is. And that might just be based on the fact of just you like the thing and you want to keep using it. The reality is a new a new Logitech wireless keyboard and mouse is like, you know, 20 or 30 pounds. But it won't be this specific one that has the, the keyboard back, that has the backlit keyboard and the rounded keys and stuff like that. And I had a conversation with the customer about this keyboard where I said, you know, look, we could replace this for the cost of repair with something that's brand new. It won't be, but it won't be as nice as this one, but still it would be brand new. And they said, oh, I appreciate that, but I really like this keyboard and I would like to continue using it. I'm familiar with it. It's an old friend, you know, and it's like, okay, that's fair enough. We'll fix the keyboard then. And I kind of like that because I just really like fixing stuff like this. And while this one, it's questionable how economical it is, sometimes you get people who have got, um, you know, like MMO gaming mice with uh, with all of the buttons down the side and stuff like that. Those mice can be really expensive, you know, like £100 expensive. So suddenly, if it's got a dodgy left click on it, um, you know, paying 30 quid to replace a switch in it or something like that, suddenly not so much of a bad idea, you know. So I wanted to make a video just saying I want to fix more peripherals. Um, and while I don't think it's always a good idea to do it, it's something that I like doing. So just putting that out there. Uh, anyway, let's roll the intro and I'm going to do a heckin' repair. Let's get into it. So this thing doesn't have any screws on the back, so I'm not quite sure how we're going to get into it yet. But there is a screw here on the back of what is presumably a battery cover. So let's open this up and take a look. And we've got a couple of AA batteries in there. So these are rechargeables. These are uh, nickel metal hydrite, NIMH, rechargeable batteries. So hypothetically, we technically don't even need to fix this keyboard you could just put these into a into a battery charger um, but that's kind of missing the point so we're going to carry on anyway so i'll just take these guys out that one's uh stuck in pretty good oh there we go the customer tells me that they have this thing plugged in all the time so i've no idea what condition those batteries are actually in either uh Right, let's take that screw out. And then I'm going to grab a prying tool and I'm just going to start seeing what covers want to come off. I think this black section will unclip and reveal more screws. Uh, let me just grab a prying tool. There's a bit of movement. I'm just going to have a look just to see if I'm breaking stuff or if that's supposed to come off. Yeah, this is double-sided taped on, so... This just needs prying up. All right, we're definitely on the right lines because I'm seeing more screws under here. This is just tough to get off. Oh, it's on its way, but it's requires a little bit of nerve. That's a lot of tape. There we go. 
Oh, there we go. Okay. So there were there were four. There were six clips. Clip, clips, and one on each side, and the rest of it was all double-sided tape. So now we know. Now let's go ahead and take out the rest of these screws. Mm. Oh, there we go. Okay, I think the top panel is coming off. There we go. That's making progress. Come on. Oh, that's that's very resistant now. I'm going to try somewhere else. Have I missed a screw? I think there's a screw under here. Yeah, there he is. Whew. Didn't think disassembly would be the hard part of this job. Okay, right. I've got it. So what we need to do... We need to pull the black bezel off, separate from the clear surround. They will actually separate. There we go. They're not going without a fight, but it will go back together again. Ha! Ah, there we go. Right. We've taken out some plastic clips along the way there. Um, and I also killed this screw post here um, when prying it up, which is how I got in deep enough to see that there were screws there. So I've damaged some of the clips in order to get that open. However, um, although I've broken clips, in my experience, it will go back together again and it will be solid. Um, because by the time we put this on and all of the screws are in, it'll stay on. There was also more double-sided tape holding it all together. This thing was really rigidly built. Uh, they very much designed this to be able to take a fall to the ground without just bursting into a million pieces, Nokia style. So, yeah. Right, we're making progress now. Um, so now we've got, the, we've got the deck. So more screws, and we're actually gutting the thing out now. I think we're past the worst part. Oh, this bit is heat staked on. So there's a plastic post here which sticks up through the clear uh, surround. And then that's been melted down on top. Um, heat stakes must be broken to remove. So we've just got to gently pop those off. We could melt those down again when putting this back on. But I probably won't bother because it's not like it's going to fall out. So... Santiago Proximity Detector. That's fun. Does this keyboard automatically switch the backlight on and off when your hands come down onto it? That's very cool. So we'll take out these screws along the bottom and then I think the actual deck will flip out. Right, so there's our deck. Here's our backlight. How's that being held in? That's got two connections up the top. So that's the backlight layer. We've got a row of LEDs along the bottom um, that will be just shining upwards. And these layers will be just various plastic polarizers that will just bounce the light around in a very uniform manner. And there's some, uh, there's a distinctive pattern there to try and focus the light a bit more on where the keys are specifically. I'm not sure if the keycaps have shine through on them, but it'll just create a bit more focal point where the where the light is actually needed. Um, the battery terminals are also screwed down, so we're going to need to desolder those um, in order to work on them.
Ah. So this uh, Santiago proximity detector, this is essentially just two, um, two metal plates. Uh, it's a circuit board with just a single metal pad along the top and along the bottom. And those two metal plates form a capacitor because a capacitor is fundamentally just two metal plates. Um, so this is just an incredibly low value capacitor. And the, um, the, the controller board in here will sense a tiny change in capacity because when, you, when I move my hand closer to here, that also alters the capacitance because my hand creates a plate that changes the capacitance between my hand and this metal plate. So when I move my hand close, the capacitance of this changes slightly and the, the control board picks that up as something within proximity. And that's how capacitive touch, touch sensors work. It's not actually you physically touching it, it's just something being close enough to alter the capacitance slightly. Uh, right, this guy's going to come out, but I've got to remove those cables, so let's fire up the soldering iron. So to remove these wires, I'm just going to flow a little bit of fresh solder onto each one first. Uh, this will, this is called wetting the joint, and flowing fresh solder on just makes it a bit easier to get it to move again, just because it's new solder, and also because I'm using leaded solder here, the leaded solder mixing with the unleaded solder lowers the melting point of the join and also makes it easier to flow. My soldering iron is on the touch on the low side. I'm just going to go to 370. And there we go. And those are just popping right off now. Oh, there's something else on the back. There's more. There's this funny little grey wire at the back. No idea what that is. Let's just pop that out. There we go. So this extra connector that was going into the back goes to two temperature sensors for the two cells. Um, so because this product is Kate has because this product has a, ba a built-in battery charger I don't know if this is required by law but because it is capable of charging batteries it has to have a thermal sensor to detect if there is a fault with the batteries that it's charging so that's what that is all about presumably the idea is it can stop charging if it senses that the batteries are way too hot although if the batteries are way too hot something has already gone wrong so questionable how useful that is but whatever uh, right i'll just flick up this locking bar now we can disconnect the keyboard deck so now we have our control board that's what we came here for cool that is about 25 30 minutes of raw footage to disassemble that but we got there in the end uh, let's get this set up and I'll show you the uh, USB connector. Okay, so here's where our USB connector was and here is where it is now. The connector itself doesn't look to be in terribly bad shape. The internals haven't broken off or anything. However, it's just broken free of its anchor points and that is just the product of bad anchoring in my opinion. Um, the anchors on this are really small. It's more or less an SMD mount USB port. A lot of people hate USB micro um, and they say, oh, it breaks all the time and stuff like that. The concept of USB micro isn't the problem. It's SMD ports like this that are just not well anchored enough. Um, any kind of mechanical port like this, really, it should be through hole. It should have pins that go through the circuit board. So then you have an anchor that is going through the board and there is no way in hell that that can actually break off of the board. Sure, the, inter the inside bit can still break, but that's usually going to be the product of people just jamming cables in, which is a fight you'll never win, no matter what port design you have. Unless it's Lightning, which ironically, despite everything, Lightning is actually a surprisingly well-designed port. Anyway, uh, let's see if I've got to spare one of these. 
I have a bag here of 100 popular USB types. So this is just a big selection pack of USB micro ports. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move this aside and I'm going to try and find a port that looks similar to this. So I'll pull these out and I've got a lot to choose from here. So what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to look at the details of this. So we've got we've got two anchors, we've got two side anchors and we've got two back anchors and they're very short and the side anchors are about halfway along. This gives us quite a lot of information to start working with. So if I just pick up a random one like uh, oh yeah, the other thing as well is it's um it's what I would refer to as the right way up as well. So the the cut up the cut corners are at the bottom. So if I now pick out this random one from the pile, you can see first of all this is inverted, so it's the wrong way up and it has four side anchors and nothing at the back. So just straight away we can dismiss that one. So just by looking for the little tells, this one is inverted, just don't bother looking at the rest of it. That's a weird one. That's a weird one. As you can see, I can start blasting through these very quickly now to find something that looks vaguely like it might be correct. This one has two side anchors and one at the back. So straight away, that might be a contender. But this is kind of more through hole. I might be able to flatten those anchors and make that work. I'm going to put that in the maybe pile. Four side anchors, very wide. Uh, this has two anchors but no rear anchors. That one looks very promising. Again, the side anchors go a little bit low. Are the back anchors wide enough? Yes, they are. This one would probably fit. How does it compare to my previous contender? Yeah, actually, I'm just I'm going with that. I think that'll I think that'll do it. I think that's a good match. I'm at least going to offer it up. So, if you don't happen to have a bag of 100, oops, I dropped one. If you don't happen to have a bag of 100 different USB ports, um, which obviously not everyone happens to have, um, you need to jump on eBay, and um, I would start by searching for Logitech. And I would start by searching for Logitech K800 USB port or something like that to see if anyone is listing spare ports specifically for this um, this keyboard, um, which they might do. Um, and if they don't, uh, I would then just start searching for uh, USB micro um, SMD or something like that to just start finding generic USB ports and then just start doing what I was doing. So look at the sides, keep scrolling through, look for ones that have anchors in the right position and stuff like that. And you can probably find something that will be compatible. So we have a candidate replacement port. Let's clean up these pads and then we can see if it'll fit on. So I'm coming back in with the soldering iron. And I just want to clean all these pads down so they're empty. So I'm going to throw on some flux. If you're using cheap wick, definitely make sure to just push it together so, it's, so it widens out like that. Don't use it while it's pulled tight. If you actually push it together so it pads out, it's drastically more effective. I'll flow some fresh solder on like I did with the... Uh, uh, with the other wires. And now we'll just wick all of that down. Now some alcohol on a Q-tip just to clean up the flux. And as you can see, we've got lovely clean empty pads now. 
So you can see that there were two anchor pads that it was soldered down to and it looks like it was relying on these two pads as adherence to the board to keep it stuck down. That's not a good design. These pads are reasonably tough but they're, they're not designed for mechanical stress in a meaningful way. If you need to take mechanical stress you need a through hole a la the holes. So this replacement one having longer legs on it hopefully that means that it will actually be stronger as a result. Failing that it should last the rest of the lifetime of the keyboard. If the keyboard has lasted I don't know five years, ten years with its first port we can reason we can make a reasonable assumption that um, as long as this is at least as strong as the standard one it will do another five to ten years of service which will easily take us past end of life for the keyboard anyway. So that has dropped into place. It looks pretty good and you can see that the pins are lining up nicely. So that port is a perfect replacement. Even though the metalwork wasn't identical, all of the anchor points line up. So we're good to go. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to solder one of the anchors just to hold it in place. I'll add some more flux because we need the solder to flow into the hole instead of sitting on top of it. I've gone completely off shot. There we go. Alright, so we stuck the port down but it's a little bit wonky so now I'll just reflow that hole and push it flat. That didn't feel like it moved at all. No, it didn't. Okay, let's try getting it from there. That's better. Now, with USB micro ports, you need to be really careful not to put too much solder on because if you put in too much solder, it will just climb and wick directly into the port. And once solder has gone inside the port, you're done, basically. Um, if solder goes inside the port, you may as well take it off and start again with a brand new port. And for that reason, make sure you buy two, because if that happens, you need a new port. Uh, I have wicked uh, solder out of the port before, but you often end up with a slightly damaged port. It's ugly. Just uh, don't, basically. Right. I'll put this back into my vise, and we can solder the rest of it on. So I'm not going to fully commit to doing the rest of the anchors yet, just in case I've got to take it out and start again. I'm going to put some flux onto those back pins, and we're just going to go in with some more solder. Now this, this soldering iron tip is a bit on the large side for this, but it should be okay. Worst case, I can drop down to a smaller tip, but we'll see if we have to first. So I've just put some solder onto the iron and I'm just working onto those pins. It's sticking to the back of the port, which is annoying, but not the end of the world. There we go. I think that's done the job. Let's inspect. fourth pin looks like it wants some more solder on it. The rest of them look good. If I touch that up, that'll probably come good. Yeah, there we go. That's fine. Let's get the rest of those anchors. Once again, adding in flux, because that will just make sure that the solder actually flows down into the hole. Alright, 
check the top. And you can see on the back anchors there, see how much solder has flowed up through those anchor holes. You can see on the right hand rear anchor that there's a huge blob of solder there. That has all gone through that hole. That's all got fed through. A little bit of it on the back I put there, but all the stuff at the bottom at the circuit board, that's all just flowed through the hole. So you can see how even though on the back it looks like there's not enough solder, it's actually just all gone straight through. So that's why it's easy to o it's very easy to overload these holes and then just flood the inside of the port. That can very easily happen if you're not careful. Either way, that guy's on. So now I'll clean up. I'll just flood that with some more alcohol, isopropyl alcohol to be precise. And just use a toothbrush just to brush the excess flux away. You can go ham with alcohol. It doesn't meaningfully damage anything. There we go. And there's always going to be some residue left. You'd have to do an ultrasonic clean on the board to, to completely sterilize it kind of thing. But that's good enough. And finally, if you want to just dry things off, just a soft brush will help there. Let's do another close-up. There we go. Those pins aren't super tidy, but they are soldered down. There's solder blobs on each pin tying it to the board, and that's the important thing. And finally, I'll just do the quick, brutal acid test of just trying to lift it up with my fingernail. It's not immediately breaking off. You'd have to test it to destruction to know how strong it really is. But if you can just give it a nudge and it snaps off, it wasn't on properly in the first place. Good. That's done. Let's put it back together again. Right, before I reassemble this, I'm just going to take the keyboard deck out to the back and I'm just going to blow this all out with my air compressor or rather my electric air duster, just to blow the dust and grit out. This is a great opportunity to clean this up. I'm not going to detail it because that'll take another hour. If I wanted to, I could systematically take off each key and really scrub this thing clean. But uh, there's, there's only so far that I will go for the amount that this is worth doing, you know. But just saying, that's a thing you could do if you wanted to. Right, back in a moment. Camera gets a little bit grainy when I punch in this far, but it does give you the nice close-up. Um, let me see. I tell you what, for the sake of consistency, I'll wick these pads down and put some fresh solder on them. Um, just for battery contacts like this, it's just a wire solder blobbed onto the circuit board, so it doesn't really need to be immaculate. But, you know, we're being nice, so let's be nice. There's a lot of solder here, so I'm just going to try and pick some of it up on the iron. Just so I don't end up using a square meter of wick. There we go. Right, and we know that we've got nice solder joints straight away because these are drying shiny instead of drying frosted. If a, if a solder join dries all frosted, then it's not a very good join. It doesn't mean it's going to immediately fail, it's just not a very good sign. So when we get nice shiny pillows, that's what we want to see. No, oh, I don't have enough solder on those. I'll touch these up again in a moment. Ah, 
Actually, you know what? I think those are fine. There's no way those are coming off. Give them the old push test. No, they're pretty good. Sometimes less is more. Right. Now I'm just going to reuse this double-sided tape. I'm just going to try and make sure that none of it is crinkled up and will sit fat. Um, it still feels fairly tacky under my fingers. If this had sort of dried out, I could use a I could use a hairdryer just to warm up the glue again, and it will go tacky. Um, but it's still tacky. So if I press this down, it'll just re-engage. Uh, this bit of plastic that was covering up over here, I'm going to leave that out because I don't really think it's doing anything of value and I tore it while removing it. So it's there to just tidy up to, well, they, they want to make the battery well look a little bit tidier, but I don't really see the value in that personally. So I'm leaving it out. I'm going to start by making sure the side uh, clips are in and the middle bit sticks up. There we go, and I'm just going to press that all down, basically. Okay, let's plug in a micro USB cable and see if it charges. There we go. Right, the LEDs are super dim on this, especially under my uh, studio lights, but as you can see, it is charging. So there we go. Oh, there we go, the keys do have shine through. There we go. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty bright backlight, actually. Neat. All right, so that is one fixed keyboard, everyone. So um, was it worth the time investment? Probably not. But I still enjoy it, and like I say, I find jobs like this to be very therapeutic. Um, so that's why I do them, and why I do them for what is not really worth the hassle. However, I hope you guys found that interesting, and if nothing else, hopefully it kind of gave you some ideas on how to approach repairs like this, um, for whether you're um, going to see if someone else can do it, or if you're kind of wondering on trying to DIY fix some of your own components, that kind of shows you the kind of construction you see in these things and how to approach it. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you as always to all of my channel supporters, including my Patreons, my YouTube channel members, uh, my Twitch subscribers, and you the viewer, finger guns. So thank you all and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.